Okay, all right. Hey, everybody. It's me. We're chilling. Uh, we're back again with some world building at Daggerford. Um, you saw here we left off on uh, Baragon Blue Sword, uh, who is an interesting character, who is thankfully a half elf, which means they have the gift of somewhat long life. Um, so he will get to be in my story and he will get to be like the old ah, I saw all the stuff type guy uh, stay a while and listen um, so I figured we may jump into just his personality as a person and we have a little bit to read on him I'll go ahead and check that out. Yeah, so let's see. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Baragon is the, the cleric of the Tempest uh, in Daggerford. Tempest is like the god of war. I guess we could read a little bit more on that right now real quick. Tempest was the greater god of war um, in the Faerunian pantheon. Uh, the lord of battles, concerned with honorable combat, forbidding cowardice, and encouraging the use of force of arms to settle disputes. Uh, to the foe hammer, war was a force of nature to be respected, for it had power to remake civilizations. Uh, in the name of Tempest, Lord of Battles, you will die honorably in righteous fire. Uh, we love it. Yeah, so it's very, uh, it's very medieval. It's very, like, night. It's very kind of like uh, fighter, paladin, even barbarian. It's got all the, those vibes to it, right? Um, let's see, Baragon went to Daggerford with the city guard of Waterdeep, uh, to fight against the evil dragon spear castle. I just want to notate what, what period that happened. Uh, this is the battle of the high moor. The dragon spear castle was a dwarven fortress built uh, upon the high moor. Um, a long and storied history within the western heartlands, which is where Daggerford is. Monstrous humanoids, devils of the Nine's Hells, and even the stronghold for Angelic Shining Lady and her crusade. What else can we find out about Dragonsburg Castle? Uh, east of Trollbark Forest. So Trollbark Forest is south of Daggerford, and so that would be east. Okay. And and this is this is good. I love just practicing this in general. Especially if you're, if you're trying to be DM, because understanding things helps you explain things, right? So, the city guard of Waterdeep is... Waterdeep is north of Daggerford, up the coast. So, he would have been traveling down through uh, Daggerford, uh, and then further south to the High Moor in order to fight against the evil at Dragonspear. Um... Finding many fighters, he established a shrine of the battle gods. Baragon had many devotees among the watered haven soldiers, some militiamen and adventurers, but only in 1370 did the common folk of Daggerford start to accept him, and still many farmers feared that Baragon would send their sons to fight in some far place. Baragon had explained many times that he sent people to battle without going himself failed to change their minds. He lived in a small house in West Daggerford, located along Wall Street near the Caravan Gate. Okay, so this is important. So I don't think I realized this last time I was reading this yesterday, right? So I kind of had maybe more ideas of grandeur as like the temple of uh, Lathander or Ottomantar. Um is like a very large temple here in Daggerford. And I kind of had the similar idea with this old guy being just another one of those like religious old dudes who, you know, has, has some, uh, you know, background as a fighter and fighting evil. Right. Um, but 
I don't, that's not the story I get here on the second read. The story I get is like, they start, just started to accept him in 1370. He could have been like, I'd say in his like, in his 30s, as he was coming down on the city guard, 20s, 30s, in that range. Um, possibly, a, you know, a high up on the guard, you know, probably very talented soldier, assumingly. Um, and, you know, after he traveled through and probably conscripted some soldiers from Daggerford to bring down to the High Moors to fight the, the evil dragon spear, um, got a bad rep. Um, now the question is that I'm asking is why did he go back to Daggerford? Why does he live in Daggerford now? And on top of that, what we would know is that he has a small house. So he's not, this is not like a very large established faith. It almost feels like it's like a broken faith or like a lost faith. And he's one of the few people that, that maybe upholds this, like the law of Tempest. And possibly I'm thinking it's like, maybe it's outdated. Like maybe we're going to be in 1500 and Daggerford has had a lot of hard times and hardship but war isn't war isn't the problem anymore. Like war with, I guess, maybe that's what it is, right? So a lot of the encounters that have been happening and are currently happening in Daggerford are like supernatural um, and interplanetary and these like very grand creatures of, of, of magnitude. We're not talking like neighboring uh, cities are fighting we're not talking about bordering like uh, bandits and stuff. Like there's basic law now, and especially with what we know. So we'll go to our dock. The Lord's Alliance. Yeah. So Daggerford is part of a part of the Lord's Alliance. Remember, state leaders. Of, uh, when did Daggerford join, though? At Morwen. Morwen's kind of old. Oh no, 1485. Hold on. She was the master of arms and duchy and the military commander of the castle. She's there, so she's currently, she's, but like, ah, uh, I'm getting some misinformation here. I'm getting a little confused. In 1486, Morwen inherited the title from Maldon when the practice of Prima Gentra was suspended. Yes, we know this. She also joined the Lord's Alliance. Okay, that's just a reminder. I probably knew that. But I was under the impression that Morwen was not... She gets switched. And it's not denoting that to me now. Um, boom, bum, ba, da, dum. Which is a little disheartening, because I'm pretty sure I, I was pretty firm, and then and that was the lore here. Um. There we go, Pinchesca. I just wasn't reading all the way. So yeah, not that long after her rule, Lady Morwen was captured by Baroness Wynne Crom and placed into a dungeon of Crom's Hold. A succubus named Pinchesca, disguised as Lady Morwen, ruled Daggerford in her stead. Uh, introduced the dragon fire, the flame. Uh, it's about five, ten years of turmoil, yada yada. We're just going to pick up right around like 1500. Um, in the, the kind of the throes of all this turmoil. And um, 
Well, essentially, it's going to be... Essentially, like, it's going to be the children, so I want to give them time to grow up. So, like, I want them to be maybe five or ten when all these events happen. And then five or ten years go by, they're about twenty years old now, joining the militia and starting to make their mark on the world. So, yeah, yeah, that's all the same. Let's check out Crown's Hole, because let's see where actual this lady actually is was a keep near the northeastern region of the Lizard Marsh in the Delambeer Vale. Crom's Hold was located about 15 miles from Daggerford. Oh, well, that's not far at all. And so this is very much, so this is, this is good. This is like, This is important. I'm going to actually just start this. Because this is my main quest. This is it. Like, this is like the grand quest. So there's going to be a bunch of other stuff happening. Like, trivial stuff. Like, below the scenes stuff. And then as these characters grow up. And as these characters obtain more skill. And quite literally level up. Um they'll start to realize and see more of the picture and more of the story. And when they get to level 15, that's when we'll have them start getting digging into the Ducal Castle and what's going on inside there with all the um, supernatural stuff. And then if they find out and if they so want to or so choose to, they can go to Crom's Hold and free Lady Morwen and put her back on the throne like she so rightfully won from her from her brother and reinstate the will of the people but honestly like the will of the people is supposedly instated because there's a fake duchess there that's living there so, right so Pancheska 1357 was assaulted by blue feather band of lizard folk they killed his son Baron Marsh into the Lizard Marsh, seeking revenge, was slain. After the War of the Silver Marches, Baroness Crom conspired with the succubus Pinchesca to usurp the Duchess of Daggerford, Lady Morwen of Daggerford, and eventually take the Duchess's place. This end, she kept the Duchess imprisoned within her keep. Question is why there's no there isn't much on Baroness Crom. Let's just look up all words of Crom. There we are. Her name is Windcrom, commander of the Lizard March, ruler of a noble human, a luskin. A water altar situated in Crom's hold, and she submitted. Late 1480s or early 1490s, Wink inspired with the succubus Pinchesca to capture the Duchess of Dragonford Morrowind. Oh, yes! So that's the motive, so... And that's, like, so evil. So the Red Wizards of Thay are the ones who con con are contracted Pinchesca. So what they did is about 1485, the Wizards of Thay, Arvik Zaltos, went in and extorted the Baroness through Black Dragon Fire, threat of Black Dragon Fire, right? And took this wa elemental water sphere, Walter, water altar, which I'll click on in a second, and then in the 1480s, like a little bit after that, or like, I'd probably, not the 80s, probably the 90s, but this is all like one plan. They sent in their, their succubus to be like, hey girl, 
Like, you got fucked over. Let's go, probably, let's go, like, get one on the boys. And, like, we'll work together. Like, let's do a devil's deal together, right? Let's go capture this duchess so I can actually be the queen. And then, I don't know, what does she gain out of that, though? What does she gain? That's what my question is. So maybe I need to, like, read into Ghost of Dragon Spirit Castle a bit. Or Storm King's Thunder. What's this water altar? The Elemental Water Sphere was a group of spells that manipulated the element of water. Druids were granted unlimited access, and clerics were granted minor access to these spells. Junior casters could cast, create, and destroy water, watery fish, oh, water... Lures, water, reflecting pool. Oh, this is a really cool item. Produce ice, transmute rock. Heart water, transmute water to dust, slash improved, create water. Conjure water elemental and or tsunami. Interesting. This is a, and I love, Forgotten Realms is great for this, of finding items that probably existed at one point. You can Google this too. Um, to see if actually some actual item exists somewhere. But, you know, it gives me an option as, as a DM to kind of create an item that I can, uh... Oh, oh do you forget Sphere? That's a, that's a spell. Item. not seeing anything so yeah but in, in in general like we can it's the general gist is there let's see one two three four five six seven so like level 20 to 19 like 18 to 12 or 14 14 to 10 10 to six six to two and like level one and two you know so like you just scale it with the levels um and like that's a really cool item so like that's gonna this item is important because that's gonna be something that the players might have access to um So again, right, there's, it could be important or it could not be important. And I love how like we're on this big, this, this big rabbit chase through Forgotten Realms, but this is like partially why I love it. Um, but so like, I always like to say like, if the players make it important, I'll make it important. Um, and on that, right, so say they figure out along the lines <clears throat> where lady morwen actually is they want to go up to the flotion estate or sorry the crom i think it's crom uh the crom estate to free her and bring her back or at least figure it out and then they get there and they talk to baroness crom and she tells her sad story about how oh they took this from me so i did this instead yada yada and, and however they judge that scene say they they could say, oh, you know, this lady's evil. She, you know, conspired with evil. Let's just, let's mark her. Get her out of here. Free the princess and bring her home, right? They could do that. Or they might want a softer approach. Maybe they want to a trade with the Baroness of Krom. And so what they could do is they could go to the Red Wizard of now, And we could send them on a rabbit hunt of, of their own. The, pl the players in the party. Um, and they could chase down the Red Wizards of Thay, obtain, say, maybe this watery sphere and several other powerful items on their mission, on their quest, and then come back to Baroness Crom and say, hey, you know, here's your 
your watery sphere and then they're like damn like this watery sphere is really good do we want to just kill this lady and just take this for ourselves or do we want to give her this legendary artifact back in exchange for the princess right and then make the players decide um and like right there like that's a level <clears throat> 15 to 20 campaign right there like that's a entire story that again if the players decide is important will be what we do and that's why, essentially why i mean you've heard me say it before on my streams like i'm leaving tier 4 open 15 to 20 is it's just gonna be open i'm gonna have everything prepared for up 1 to 15 and then once we get to 15 i'll sit down we'll have a deep conversation with the players and we'll, we'll, we'll think and talk about their motives and you know what what they see with their players and where they want to go right um and if maybe fixing and solving the roots of Daggerford is their what they is their dream their vision then this is the rabbit hole that we'll chase down <clears throat> i'm stoked like that's awesome so <clears throat> with that being said With that being said, Baragon Blue Sword is a very important character. And a very important character for two reasons. Because they have history and knowledge of Daggerford before, and they also have a relationship with the actual Lady Morrowin, who after being surplanted, would no longer come down to the little temple of Tempest anymore to see her good friend Baragon Blue Sword. Ah, uh, exactly. So this is why we do our research. This is why we just do a little digging. And that's going to play into his personality too. So, um, let's see. How would that make him? Maybe he's a little, little crazy? Maybe he's a little crazed? No, maybe he's... Untrusting. And... We don't put ands because we don't, it's redundant. Reluctant. I believe that's what it means is what I mean. So let's check. If it means what I think it means. Yeah, unwilling or hesitant. This dude's like, gonna be like kind of cooped up. Um... Because he's really old and he is half human, so he's gonna be a little crazy, um, like a little senile. Question mark? Because like, I think I feel or I see this character like saying things, or like having little outbursts of the history or the truth. And at first glance, it seems like this dude's crazy. But in reality, he's actually like telling the people exactly what's going on or exactly how things are, asking the question that should be asked at that moment. So it's like senile question mark, as in like not actually, but I, I wanna play with it in that sense. Um, So there's just looks here, looks here. And we're gonna have to write a bit more on, underneath. I don't know where I should put it here. I should maybe move these links to another s at the end. Um, cleric of Tempest. Let's get some imagery. See, I was thinking blue, but it's red actually. That's the jam. Tempest is red and white and yellow. Oh, and cool. So yes, he's called Blue Sword, but why is that when fire and red is like the jam? But like maybe his sword burns so hot the flames turn blue. That's what's badge about him. 
So, yeah. Old gray. Hey, hey! Thanks for the follow. See uh, you joining in there. Was that Stinks? What's up, Stinks? Um, we just finished a, <laughs> a big rabbit chase through Forgotten Realms fandom, and, uh, well, essentially found the roots and the, the, the reasons why this guy is going to be whom he is. He's old, he's gray. Um, uh, frail. Frail looking. Yet strong. This is an old warrior of Tempest, so like he's like I get like that like like that like he grabs you and you're like you don't think he could grab you that hard, but like he's actually you know, like um scars riddled all along his Body. Um, let's see. White robes with red trim and sash, like kind of like a sash that like hangs down. Um, and he's gonna be like a fairly main in character. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I should go over here and do this. Make this dude green because he's an important character. Um, Cut this, paste it there, control X for cut, control V for paste, we all know that one. Cuts a little bit better, especially when you're doing Excel cells, because it'll pick the whole thing up and move it. So you don't have to control copy, then delete, it like just gets rid of a step for you. Um, Let's knee. Nah. Small, forgotten. And then also, yeah, so this could also play into it too a bit. So Pancheska doesn't like this guy. Because Pancheska knows that he knows the real Lady Morwen. And maybe there'd be some altercations here or there, maybe not so much anymore because he's older. But like, Pancheska would very much be probably stifling any progress or good name that Tempest might have in Daggerford. Propaganda, right? And kind of trying to decrease the amount of followers at this temple anyways. And maybe, just so ha so luckily, you know, one of my players is like, eh, I'm like a Tempest, I'm a Tempest Paladin, right? And they're like, oh, like, maybe Baragon Blue Sword is just my, my head priest, and, you know, that just so happens. Or maybe they run into him through investigative work, or maybe just through random chance, right? Or maybe I force feed this old guy in front of him one day at, at you know, the fish fly. You know, who knows? Um, the, but the pieces will be there for me to play with. Is essentially, you know, we're just building all the pieces today. Hey, so just saw your, your chat there, Stinks. Um, so we are working on a campaign that I'm going to be launching, I believe, Jan end of January, February. Um, and so my goal with this campaign is I really wanted to see or like test myself with how well I could flesh out a world um, and you'll see here a lot of what I'm 
doing with my world build is, uh, you know, using real 5e lore. So quite literally, I'm, what I like to do with my campaigns is find a point in the story that kind of where the story stops or there's like a void in the story where it kind of is, is kind of vague and they didn't really flush it out too much. Find a hole that I can stick myself in as the dungeon master and then create a story for my players to play in. And so I kind of like create my own module in the D&D world for my players to make their own story. Um, and what I love about it is, you know, you pull from all these other elements and all these other lore points of the world around these players. And I think it's a really great method in which to, you know, really immerse your players. You know, right? For example, like if you have experience as a as a D and D player going to Boulder's Gate, and maybe that looks several different ways with your players, but there's you know several similarities as well. Um, but you know, you'll remember that. And when Daggerford talks about Boulder's Gate as its biggest competition, and like ah, oh, you know, you know, everyone's always leaving here and going down to Boulder's Gate to find work. You know, like yada yada yada. Like, that's just going to resonate more with the players. Um, when you say that Baragon Blue Sword was an old guard of Water Deep, you know, it, like, that resonates with the players. People have been to Water's Deep. They've, they've played campaigns there. They've done things there. You know, like, it's part of their, their headcanon already. Uh, so that's kind of just, like, my DM style. And, like, what we're doing here is we're, we're building Dagger for it up. We're fleshing it out. The story pretty much ceases um, around 1485, 1475, 1490 in that range. So my story is going to start at 1500 DR. And uh, what I'm doing now is taking an awful lot of time to write the backstory of Baragon Blue Sword, just like the notes. Small Forgotten Temple to. This temple, I know what Satemp is. Um, not many people uh, frequent this faith anymore as it's being lost to time. Parentheses, Pancheska. Propaganda as well. Um, was a friend of the, I guess, yeah, of Lady Morwen and misses her dearly, suspects Pancheska's a fraud. Often speaks in often speaks small out first. About the truth. Daggerford? Daggerford. So. Let me read that over again. There's a small forgotten temple. Not many people frequent this faith anymore, as it's being lost to time. A and B, propaganda from Pancheska. Uh, this friend of Lady Morwen misses her dearly, suspects Francesca is a fraud, often speaks in small outbursts about the truth of Daggerford. Uh, what else did I miss there? 
Oh, blue sword, blue sword. Blue sword. Is a magical long sword, which I'll make later. Uh, we love long swords. They're just canonically cool. Um, and I feel like a Tempest would have, a, you know, a shield and a sword. And then maybe that shield gets tossed and you go two-hand, which is why we like the long sword. Uh, long sword. Magical blue sword is a magical long sword. Wreathed in blue flame. Okay. Just so I can remember that. There's going to be a lot of stuff I work with in between that now and there. Yeah, so I love I love any advice. So a lot of times like helps with names or like ideas with backstory while I'm while I'm like, you know, just spilling my brain out onto onto the camera. Um, you know, and anything you got. I love it. So like for example, uh Novel and what else here? And Nobrin were two names that I was uh, gifted from somebody yesterday. Um, who was it? It was uh, Xanderfell. So nicely came up with some cool names for me. Um, and I have this actually, they, they gave me a really nice write up on a description for some very ominous and dangerous evil creature. Um, it was too too intense for any of my my town town people. These are all just like regular village people. In, in a sense, um, with, with histories, but, uh, on first glance, they're just like the right, that's the old guy on the corner and that's, you know, the family that runs the fish fry, right? So, um, where we are now is Harold's Runner's Union, which I love this red mark, so I know that I need to fill that. So somebody needs to be like the leader of that. So for example, I have the, the head smith of the, the general of the, uh, the head smith, Rucklin Smith, is of, of the Merchants Guild. Um, you know, so someone's going to be living somewhere else that is important and runs this building. So you normally have a house. And, and a lot of times in medieval settings, you'll have people like Carl Noville, the Flying Fish. His whole family lives at the Flying Fish. And he sells and runs his business at the Flying Fish. So that exists quite frequently. Um, but with some stuff like Harold's Runners Union is like a post office, if you will. So I wouldn't surmise somebody lives there. It's probably a place that gets locked up um, at the end of the night. Um, same thing with like some of these shrines, but not the case with some of these shrines. Um, so it all depends. It's really, you know, whatever I prefer story wise for the elements. A local myth? Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you got? Because. Like, for example, um, I can, I'll find a way to work it in. Like, just give me something juicy. And I have, I have 150 people here. Like, I'm already a third of the way into this. So, you know, I got plenty of open space, right? So, Janison. Janison uh, is a distraught, depressed, but yet hopeful uh, mid-40s woman who lost her child. And, uh, let's see, there's, people hear rumors of strange noises and see ominous lights during the late hours of the evening and maybe like her her dead son like haunts her windows taps on her windows and howls at the eve in the evening right in the witching hour um so like stuff like that like juicy stuff like give me something and i'll find a spot for it i tell you uh i'll be right back i'm just gonna heat my coffee up uh i love i love my coffee hot be right back <laughs>
Get a ribbon. What do you got for me, Stings? Give me a myth. Give me something. Give me something juicy. Give me something I can work with, buddy. I love it. Like all the more you dungeon master, and especially if you if you world build, like have all the inspiration, my guy. Like all the inspiration from anywhere and everywhere that possibly exists. Um, don't ever stop. We can skip the barracks because. Um, It's important and it needs to be fleshed out fully. And I think when I'm ready to do the first tier right up, I'll get into that. I don't want to do anything too important right now. Um, Decoran needs to be moved. Or how many boat raids do I have? I don't need to move them yet. The jail does need to be moved. That's important. Empty. What's a constable? You know what a constable is, Stinks? A place, uh, a peace officer with limited policing authority, typically in a small town. Oh. Constables are empowered to enforce both criminal and civil laws. Criminal and traffic laws. Sheriffs are the chief law enforcement. Okay, so like, there's no, <laughs> there's no traffic laws here, <laughs> as we don't we don't live in a world of roads <laughs> in medieval fantasy. <laughs> so okay, cool. So a constable is important as well. These things will need to be erected quickly and effectively. And we'll tie together too. The constable will be in charge of the jail, and the jail will be right next to the constable's building. The blacksmith's guild house would. Okay, so you'll probably be done. Decoran's done, probably. I don't know. The blacksmith's guild would probably have enough financials to re re to re up end themselves durable iron eater died who is durable iron eater was the last king of Clan Iron Eater who went on to become a blacksmith in Daggerford. Where'd he work, though? How old is he? Give me some dates, people. Give me some dates. They're a dwarf. Traveled to Daggerford with his brothers. His brother disappeared, never heard from again. Durbel's Bright Blade. Learning alongside his daughter. Died in 1484. Huh. So his daughter might have be alive because she might have been at the forge and your dad was home so she's important and I believe bright blade would still be still didn't get destroyed I believe that's okay yeah Dervil's bright blade is now run by his daughter Bentley. And you're dead, buddy. Uh, Dunedin. 
Ooh, that's a cool name. Dunedin, eh? Oh, okay, we got something. Let's see. Um, maybe there's sort of a boogeyman type myth of a man with a twisted posture and clawed fingers that knocks on your door in the dead of night asking for solace. If you let them in, they'll supposedly protect you from harm for a short duration. But if you deny them, they'll haunt you in your darkest moments like a hungry predator. Call them something like the Crooked Beggar. Hmm. 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 Interesting. Let me put this down in my Zideas tab. Let me think. Let me think on this. Because I do. I have a character similar. And maybe that I could have reworked that into a. Uh, maybe I could possibly rework that into one of the characters that I already have, like, kind of conceived here. Um, let's see. don't have this character written down or flushed down anywhere so it's just still in my brain I guess uh, so essentially the character yeah I still have, yeah so I have a character there it is right here murders the Duke's council in act two so I have a character that essentially is going to be like a I don't know, I guess I'll just, like, if you've ever watched My Hero Academia, the character Stain um, is kind of like a character who upholds law in an evil fashion. So they're very much lawful evil, um, where they kind of kill people in the name of they're not worthy to be a hero and they're not worthy to uphold the law, right? So kind of like a, like a cop killer, almost. Um, and so they're a murderer, right? And they're a bad person, right? But they're doing it for a good reason. And so how I'm going to write that into my story is kind of, if you've been following along or you can look at some of my past Daggerford streams, um, Pancheska is a succubus who's currently sitting on the throne uh, as Duke of Daggerford. And I feel like this person might have found out in some way or fashion, right? And perhaps they're killing people that are corrupt on the council of the Duke. And they're doing it on behalf of, you know, these people aren't, actual leaders and they're you know they're corrupt leaders etc etc so i'm not sure how i want to write him in yet entirely um but maybe that could be an element a crooked beggar maybe there's like hmm <laughs> hmm the epic music while I try to while I try to think about this. Crooked beggar. And like also like I love the idea of just having random story elements, you know, so like in the same sense with Janison and her son, like it's gonna be a big city. You know, there's gonna be a lot of stuff that could and possibly will be going on. So I think I think I'll keep it in mind as I work through some more of these characters and see see if I find any roots to something that kind of leads me to that that path, that character. Like somebody who wants to uphold the idea of charity, right? For the sake of charity's sake, not for gain or, or agenda, right? Um, similar to Stain, but like a different concept with instead of like corruption it's more rooted in in um in good morals right 
they're like a spirit or a specter of good morals. A Christmas, haunt you of Christmas baths, almost. Just kidding. Um, so let's see, Dunedin, 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 Dunedin. Human, human. Dunedin just sounds like a human though, right? Verse 41, so this is when we love, we see where they, where, what lot they live in. And then we go see where their house is. This is a big green house. Right next to the fish fry. Hmm. Let's go check Forgotten Realms. Doing it in. Eh? Dunedin was an old apothecary inhabiting the city of Daggerford in the western heartlands of the mid to late cities, uh, 14th century. He lived in a house in the south section of Daggerford near the drill field. Dunedin plied his trade from Harvest House. So this dude just makes buku, buku dinero? Harvest House was a temple of Shantea in Daggerford. It was led by priestess uh, Mary Vinin, Mer, Merovinia. Ugh, these names, man, they're crushing me today. Farmers around Duke Way. House the shop of the old Dunedin, the only apothecary of Daggerford. Okay. All right, so we have this, which house is this? The Harvest House, Shantea. Let's go find the Harvest House. There you are. And... Apothecary. to the winter and there could be a tradition where someone pretends to be the crooked beggar for a festival except without the killing no honestly I mean we're joking but maybe that maybe that does hold some 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 play right so in Daggerford it's a city and I've often talked about this I think I talked about this yesterday right where you, there's this event where a dragon had come and you know flew through the city and destroyed a whole bunch of the town and flew away right so like if you live there like you you would start coming up with like lingo or like slang like you call it the dragon's fire you know like you'd you'd you say you know or the the great fire right there would be some type of like like norm or like hearsay like you know so in the same same concept like there would be there would be myths and lores and legends and stuff like that, you know, like they wouldn't necessarily, like they'd have holidays and they'd have stuff. So like normally in D&D, I kind of just like avoid most of this. And if I was to like use a holiday, it would be like more rooted in like, like old, old holidays, like, like uh, winter solstice, you know, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, that's actually, I kind of like that direction a bit better. Like, maybe that's, like, their Santa Claus, the, the Crooked Beggar. Maybe we come up with a cool name for, for him or something. And maybe that's what, that's what we did. And maybe, so maybe, we'll go a step further with this. Maybe somebody, not a supernatural, but somebody, a person, is, like, taking up the role as the Crooked Beggar. 
and like it could be if if my characters ever decide they want to be the new constable and they want to like uphold the law that could be like one of the the cases they have to solve the case of the crooked beggar all right right like so like stinks <laughs> stinks i joke but often this is like the path to really good ideas so like a few days ago i was joking with one of my my uh viewers about having a centaur be the the stable master of the stables in daggerford or just one of them maybe and then i was like well what if, what if i like rolled this a bit further right and like actually try to tie it to some story and create something that makes sense so there's the forest just north of here that the dragon would have also laid fire to probably um and you know she's like a refugee that's like fallen from that that forest and has come down to daggerford to just live a regular life and have a job and exist and her trade is she's a druid who speaks to horses and you know she's the liaison for horses to be rented in daggerford she makes sure the horses are taken care of and their voices are heard um and also she could have story roots tied to if the characters want to go up to the arty forest or they want to go to the Flotion estate which is a very important pillar story uh that exists here so you know like i feel like i'm creating a lot of content here as far as like storytelling elements but yeah i have to remind myself that i'm not going to use all of these i'll probably use some of these and more or less i'll probably have a path of these that i use as the players decide what they want to do level up and kind of get to a point where they don't talk to these people anymore and then they're off doing their own thing um they use these people as like a catalyst almost let's see um, we're on dunedin the Dunedin house did not get destroyed. It's a very large house. Dunedin has a child. Dunedin has a family. Dunedin is a human, so presumably is dead. Because they worked in the 1400s. So, yeah, we're just going to skip it down a line. And I guess in this case, we'll just make Dunedin a last name. And we'll go to human name generator, just because I like, uh, this is how I like to get my inspiration. Dunedin. So what I like to do normally in this situation is find Duthamri, Yenra Dunedin, Yenra. Yenra Dunedin. Oh, Yenra Dunedin. I like that. That works for me. Um... Let's see, and who is Yenra? Her father is a, a businessman, an apothecary, apothecary. Isn't much on him as a person. So I guess it could be whatever. We can just do whatever we want, really. Um, uh, kind, helpful, pathetic. A very caring individual that just is, is all about medicine and helping and, and does whatever they can within their power. Um, a human human 
what is she gonna look like? Probably has some some Shantaea roots. Probably follow is, is a Shantaea follower. Shantaea priest. The Harvest God. Green and yellow. Ooh, I like this, but she's not old. And I like get warm vibes. Whenever I talk about Shantaya, it's always the warmest vibes. Warm. Warm face. Lightly blush. Cheeks. Soft eyes. Where's um robes? No, she's a gown of uh, cream with gold trim and frill. A crown of seasonal flowers. Okay. Carry in the harvest in the harvest house. In the harvest house. Father. Father's name. Buldik Dunedin. Buldik Moing. No, no, I don't like any of these. Jubud? Jubud? What type of name is Jubud? What names are these? Naden? Hassan Dunedin? Uh, let's see, maybe they're afraid of being forgotten and by extension their own mortality. So they do whatever they can to heal others so they have positive memories of them. Hmm. Yeah, like maybe that's like the whole like the whole concept. Like maybe like that's their Christmas, right? Maybe that's like their holiday and their their story. Maybe like, like that's the people will often 
like sell uh, or, or practice good charity in the spirit of you know and like honestly like so like this is really good so stuff like this can like just get rolled into role play you know where, where like one of the locals will be like um uh oh you know it's uh it's it's bad luck to to not tip a beggar you wouldn't want uh you wouldn't want the crooked beggar instead would you you know stuff like that where, like, you know, at least give the dude a copper, you piece of shit. Like, um, and you can just, like, put it into your roleplay. C- create create a, a, a vibe around it, you know? And have little little tidbits like that to make it make the world seem a bit more real. Right? It's a great idea, Stinks. I love it. Alright, I just gotta pick a name here. Grunil Dunedin. I like Grunil. There we go. Her father, Grunil. Was a renowned healer. And... Yenra upholds this tradition. Often lends aid to individuals of note and can be seen Helping around dagger herd. Okay. That's Yenra. What we got here? The Money Lenders Coalition. I'm gonna read that. A lot of these these jobs and stuff that need I'm gonna wait until I get down to my like, like, I got a big group of houses down here. Like, big, big group of houses. And it's uh, ordered numerically right now. So right now, I'm, I'm just, like, working my way through the river quarter. I can show you. I'm working my way through the river quarter down here. Uh, the riverman's quarter. So, like, as I get up into, like, the money quarter, all those are the types of people that will be, like, running these big establishments, running these stores, these these places. Oh, nice, dude. Cookies for the holidays. Love it. Actually, I'll probably be making some Christmas treats with the wife, too, so enjoy. We'll see you, and thanks for the follow. <laughs> let's see, let's see, let's see. The river shining tavern. And the clean shin, oh yeah. River Shining Tavern needs a needs a person that runs it. But like a place this would probably be an in-house. Like I would assume, an, if you're a tavern in the medieval time, you wouldn't have two houses. Well, like, no, you. Uh, yes and no. Where is it? Forty-three. Business and guilds, a fairly large establishment. What else is next to it? 42, 44. Okay, yeah, we'll say these will be houses. Moneylenders Coalition, I would think, was a group of individuals that operated in Daggerford during the mid-century. They increased their wealth by lending money to others on the condition of repayment. Dubba-dur. 
Coalition offered loans to entrepreneurs and prospective business owners along with those people interested in undertaking the, a life of adventure. They charged 10% interest on business loans and 20% on adventuring loans. To ensure they received payment, they put borrowers under the effect of the Gase spell or placed upon their fingers a cursed ring that ensure they would return to their headquarters once every three, once every three, ten days. These effects were negated when the loan was paid off in full. Hmm. Okay, so it's a group. This would be like a... Yeah, I wouldn't, this wouldn't be a house. These people would have good money. So, would be somebody from the money district that lives here. Let me just take this. Oops. Take that. And we're just going to stick that right in. There we go. I'm going to make it fit the way the rest of them fit. I'm going to take a fiver real quick.
All right. The dungeon Meowster has returned. Burr, it's a little chilly. All right, where are we? We're getting, making some progress. We, we did a lot of skips, okay, but we're making some progress, okay? <laughs> um, we just did Coalition House. I don't know who's running it yet. We'll find out when we get into the Mighty District, we said. The Clean Chin, Garrick Honestone. Let's see if he exists and if he had to have a family in order to continue his rule of the... Yes, he exists! <laughs> Was an undertaker under, and barber who lived in Daggerford in the year 1370. As a devout follower of Garl Glittergold, Garrick was ironically not allowed to shave his own beard. He had a wife named Rana and a daughter called Hanette. Ah, yes! We love this! So, Hanette... Wait, are they dwarves? They are dwarves! Yes! She's gonna have a beard that she can't shave! Hanette Honestone... Then we'll just keep reading. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. When Garrick first arrived in town, he started an undertaker service called The Fallen Man in a two-story building with his apartment on the upper floor. However, the death rate in town did not generate much business. He was curious about why humans shaved their beards. So he tried shaving a cadaver for the experience. He enjoyed it and found he had a knack for shaving other people. So he split his shop into two equal parts and began to offer a barber service in the other half. His great skill with the straight razor brought humans and gnomes to his barber shop. The clean chin, the clean chin, to have their beards or heads shaved. After Garrick passed away, his daughter Hanette took over the family business. Dang, so like, there was a lot of death. And if they... <sighs> I'm thinking, I'm thinking. What's an under... I want to see more specifically what an Undertaker's service... Ah! Undertaker's service would be. A funeral director. Prepare. For funerals. Hmm. I don't want this to be their business anymore, so it's not. And we'll say after Hanette took over, who's been there for some time, uh, um, Barber and house. Uh, Daggerford's premier salon and barber. <clears throat> it's run by. Garrick, I love that name. By Garrick. Now then past down to pass down. Uh, 
that's redundant. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one here. Beauty. Who's beard? is just as majestic as her mane. Uh, let's see. Green eyes. See, this is also known as the Watchful Protector. It's a lawful good greater deity of gnomes, Garla, the lords of the Golden Hills, as the deity of luck and protection and trickery. Okay. <clears throat> Green eyes that match her jewelry. She wore gowns of gold. The red trim. All right. Uh, uh, let's see if this person was important. A businessman. Was a businessman inhabiting the city of Daggerford. He owned the lavish Chateau Elite Inn located in the central Daggerford Hill Road. Papa Blackinson entered, catered to every whim of his patrons and charged appropriately for his services. Okay. He said this was destroyed, but what was the name of the business? The Chateau Elite. I don't see a Chateau Elite. Alright, so he's just done and gone. Forty eight Bjorn. Right, let's see your forty eight lie. Um Ah, oh, we're into the money district. And that's a very, very large house. Um, 
let's see if Bajoran exists. Yup. Bjorn was a Northman, a human, who led the village of Bjorn's Hole in the mid-14th century. Bjorn's son, of his father's name, commanded a village of around 500 people. He was fairly bad-tempered, but treated the citizens of Bjorn's Hole as his family. Uh, uh... No, this is a different Bjorn. Oh no. This is the same person. Bjorn was a landlord inhabiting the city of Daggerford, Western. He owned a large compound that he rented out to destitute tenants. He used hired muscle to let, collect rent. Okay. All right, this is our first lawful evil human. The mid to late. So dude's fine. Dude's good. just going to be an older cat. He's still alive. Same dude. We're going to take this tidbit here. Often works with the thieves brotherhood or I think that's what they're called I'll go back and change it I guess I could just go look now yeah it'd be over here thieves brotherhood yep Question is, is where is the Thieves Brotherhood? Maybe this is it. Black suit and jacket. Has a cane, too. What type of cane? We'll let Hero Forge decide that, probably. Okay. This jewel family was a rather small jewelry shop located in the town of Dagford. It was owned and operated by the Duke's court jeweler, Corpus Bright Jewels. So, okay. There were no much living quarters within the basement. Ooh. Corpus crafted all manner of ornamental jewelry, unusual earrings, bracelets, even. Trinkets could not be detected by magic. Ooh.
Nice. This dude's a baller. Uh, we'll just take this note and bring it with us. It's a lot to copy. Okay. Male gnome. Oh, he lived. He lived there. Yeah, in the basement. Curves bright jewel, and actually, um, rebuilt. In the house. It's going to be rebuilt because even though it was destroyed by Dragon's Fire, it was. These guys have a lot of money and <laughs> there's a house in the basement! So they would have been protected while everything above them got destroyed. But they could afford to rebuild. Recently. Rebuilt. After. The Dragon's Fire. No, she's a human. Easily have found work at the higher class venue of Waterdeep, but preferred the life that could only be found in a small town. He is also an expert at identifying gems, magical or otherwise. His home is located in Timora Alley in North Central Dagfer behind the Harvest House. Chaotic neutral. Love it. So we can add this. Makes missions. 
for everyone from the Duke's Council to the Thieves Brotherhood. This dude works for anybody and everybody and has doesn't doesn't pick a side. Barrels, fine jewelry and apparel. Let's see if they exist already. And now this is what I was hoping for. Is a lot of this stuff is written for me, you know? This is the beauty of working with real content. You know, like this is all stuff that's just isn't being used. It's all all lore that's just forgotten and, and, and left on the side unless you go back and you play um The Guide to the Savage Frontier. I think this is what it comes from. There's a big appendix on there. Ferrell's Fine Jewelry and Apparel is a high-end outset shop located in the town of Daggerford. It was run by Ferrell, a representative of the Waterhavian Trade Consortium. The shop was located in Daggerford's Money Quarter in central Daggerford. The shop offered high-quality textiles such as silk and furs and were imported from faraway realms. He was always looking to buy unique pieces of jewelry, either mundane or magical, in nature and sell them for exorbitant prices. So yeah, we can just copy and paste you away. Who runs this? A uh, human male. This is a shopkeeper in the century in the mid to late. So they would just be old. Excel that rematching precious gems acquired through questionable methods. I don't know what that means. Rematching. Lawful neutral. Let's see. Exorbitant. Exorbitant is not the right word. 
Exorbitant. Still spelled it wrong. <laughs> um, let's see. Human, old, sold, mainly apparel, but attempted to compete with rival Corvus. In the trade of jewels and items, however, his prices were exorbitant. Um, <clears throat> old with noticeably dyed, I can't spell today, dyed hair. Showcasing one of his new purchases for sale. All right. Uh, oh, hey, Jim mm, Peckable. Oh, Jim Peckable. There it is, Jim Peckable. <laughs> How you doing? What's going on? I've been like rolling through so many fantasy names and like my my phonetics are all jumbled right now. I'm good. How are you doing, Jim Peckable? Starting to get a little a little tired here. But I'm like, my body's tired, but my brain's firing, you know? Da 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 Narthen's fine food destroyed. Well, let's, let's inspect. See who Narthen is. It was an upscale market located in town Daggerford. It catered to both wealthy Daggerford residents and those visitors who had enough gold to afford his steep prices. Narn shop was protected by a ward that preserved all the food within and prevented it from going bad. The shop offered a wide variety of high quality foods and spices from across Faerun as far as as far away as Chult or even the ice mountains in the north. Where does Narton live is the question. Let's see if we can find him anywhere else. Yeah, we can just get rid of this place. It's the last place to get destroyed. So yeah, swath on that. We're looking at 52, Narton's right next to Lady Lux. 
I'm actually right next to the Merchant's Guild. So... It could be rebuilt. What do I need rebuilt? Actually, you know what? The Waterman Circle needs to be rebuilt. But, would they not? If this other house was destroyed, that's a bigger lot, it seems. And it's right in the district. So yeah, 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 we'll run with that. Martin's fine food is now going to be Waterman's Circle. Martin is gone. Guild slash housing. I don't want housing tenement. I actually should go back up here to um, the River Shining Tavern. Queen Chin, yep, that's that. That's that. What is the River Shining Tavern? Here we go. This is what I'm looking for. Mm. Tenement. That's all I wanted to do. Um, mm, you're important. We need a, a leader for you of some sort. This is no longer true. <clears throat> Let's see. Let's see if this exists and more. It does. It's a guild hall for ferrymen, another waterman in the city of Daggerford. The guild hall is located in Cobb Alley. And the da, 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 da. Yeah, that's it. So. Yep. Let's see what Lady Luck is. That exists and more. Does it was a tap room in Daggerford dedicated to Timora and those that took risks, including soldiers, thieves, and adventurers. The tavern was located in Daggerford. Two Fort Tavern featured a rough pillar in the center that patrons attempted to climb, leaving a mark where they reached the top. That's cool. Around 1370, the tavern was located in the Mother Quarter. Moved to the Caravan Quarter, just within the town's caravan gate. As of the year of the Nether Mountain Scrolls, the owner of the tavern was a human woman named Glennis. She encouraged gambling in the tavern and even sponsored larger games each night. The tavern was frequently frequented by Curran Corvalin, a halfling chosen of Timora, who sponsored 
filling Timora's cup, a ceremonial offering to the goddess, should she want to stop by for a drink. These are really good storytelling points. I'm just going to take them all. Glennis. Whoops. Glennis. Human. Crash. Um, brave. And uh, bold. I don't think that's how you spell blouse, but I can't spell for jargon today. It's O. Yeah, blouse. And leather pants. Bends nightly. Many men attempt to make advances, but are met with a black. I instead. All right. Uh, and we've made it to the Merchant's Guild. Which I need more. We're going to be more advisors. So we're going to put it red. Let's get a last name for Glennis here. Female names. Hopefully, the name starts with a G. First name to start with a G. First name to start with a G. Not getting many, hey? Hey, Glennis. Downor, Stonor, Hello, Bet Bestu, Glennis Bestu, Glennis. Mm. 
Brent's boss, Strong Steam, Mammon, Honest to Come, Linus. <clears throat> These names are horrible. Striking out here. Far eye. Far eye. Glenn is far eye. We like that. Fair eye. Glenn is fair eye. Um, okay. The Jewelers Congress is next, and we're gonna really start getting into some, some juicy stuff over here. But I am unbeat. Red, we got lots of reds popping up. Things that need to be rebuilt. Right. Well, thanks for stopping by, Jim Basil. It was a, uh, it was nice having somebody here for the back end of my my stream. Appreciate that. Um, I will be streaming tomorrow. Uh, so uh, if you want to check me out, you check uh, more of my work. We'll see you then. Take it easy, everybody. Peace, peace.